Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher, founder of Simply Plant Based, where I have programs to help you to change your health destiny, including the Pregnancy Advantage, where Dr. Deborah Shapiro, who is an OBGYN, she and I help women to get their bodies pregnant ready or to help heal their bodies if dealing with infertility issues, as well as the Plant Based Academy, where I provide help, support, guidance, and resources for people to help switch to a plant based lifestyle. And today I have the honor and privilege of connecting with Dr. Michelle Tollefson, who is a woman's health and lifestyle medicine expert. Her expertise is shared through her books, research, publications, workshops, speaking engagements, and consulting work. She is a board certified OBGYN, and she's a professor in the health professions department at the Metropolitan State University of Denver. And last but not least, she oversees the lifestyle medicine program. And let us not forget that she is the co-editor of the book, Paving a Woman's Path Through Menopause and Beyond. So Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me here today. Oh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, okay, let's start with the basic because I always like starting at the beginning. <laughs> what, what is lifestyle medicine? Sure, sure. So for me, I define lifestyle medicine as the use of any evidence-based healthy lifestyle behavior that can help prevent, treat, and sometimes reverse chronic disease. So under the under a lifestyle medicine umbrella, there are typically six pillars that are discussed. The first being nutrition. And for me, that means a whole food plant predominant diet. The next is physical activity. So that includes exercise as well as just what we do throughout the day, that, that daily movement. The next is stress reduction or managing our stress in a healthy way. The fourth is sleep prioritization. It's often overlooked in our society today, but prioritizing sleep is known as prioritizing healthy interpersonal relationships. So not just how many likes we have on social media, but those really true, meaningful interpersonal connections. And the last is avoiding risky or addictive substances. So those are the kind of the six main pillars of lifestyle medicine. If it's evidence-based, it falls under that umbrella for, for me. Well, okay. So talk to us about how you connected with lifestyle medicine and became a leader in this field. Cause it's a relatively new area. It is. I like to say that it is cutting edge science. However, it's what my grandmothers told me growing up. So it's the eat lots of fruits and vegetables, get outside and play. Don't go to bed too late. Be nice and have friends. Don't be overly stressed and avoid smoking. Right. So it's, it's the wisdom that our that has been passed down through the generations. However, it's that our society has strayed from a lot of that or those things often aren't prioritized, but they really should be the foundation of health. And so we have a lot of cutting edge research that shows us that the things that our grandmas were telling us to do, that they really are backed by, that they really are backed by science. I grew up really healthy. I ate ingredients that were from my dad's garden that my mom cooked for home cooked meals. I played tennis, I danced. I wasn't super stressed. I got enough sleep and I had good friends. So I grew up really thriving in a, in a healthy environment. I knew that I wanted to be a doctor from a young age, but then when I went to medical school and started my training in medical school and residency, I was just surviving. My mom's home cooked meals with ingredients from my dad's garden were replaced by cafeteria food. Often drug reps would bring us food that was like takeout. And I sometimes would even eat food at the McDonald's in our hospital basement that was open after our cafeteria had closed, joining my patients who were pushing their IV poles in line. And I tried to order the healthier options like the fruit and yogurt parfait, but still I was not eating a very healthy diet. I was just surviving. I didn't have time to exercise. I would run quickly to emergency deliveries, but I didn't have time to exercise. I slept very little, often doing shifts that were over 24 hours long, delivering babies. I was in a high stress environment, typically working about 80 to 100 hour work weeks. I didn't have time for strong connections except for my patients and my fellow doctors. And so I really was just surviving, but I got out of residency and I wanted to get back to thriving. I came home to Colorado and I started to really focus on lifestyle as medicine. The better I felt, the more I started to eat a lot of whole foods and a lot of plant-based meals. The better I felt, the more I exercised and got in a lot of physical activity and prioritized sleep, the better I felt, the more it made me go look into the research. And then I shared that with patients 
And I realized my patients started to feel better. I started to feel better. My family members started to feel better. And it was almost like I found a new secret superpower in sleep prioritization, managing stress, physical activity, and in eating a whole food plant predominant diet. So I shared this with everyone that I could. I became guest faculty for the Harvard Institute of Lifestyle Medicine probably about 15 years ago or so now. And then about a decade ago, became a professor at Metropolitan State University of Denver, where I created and oversee the first Bachelor of Science in Lifestyle Medicine in the United States. I was one of the first two physicians trained as a wellness coach because we can know that it's good to eat healthy food and to get enough physical activity, but when life gets crazy, that can be so hard and behavior change is really hard. And so that science of behavior change, learning about lifestyle medicine and then that behavior change, both of those just really made me extremely passionate about it and getting the message to anyone who would listen. Okay. Wow. That's awesome. That is just amazing. I mean, and and the path that you took and I see part of it is your personal journey. So that is just, I, I think pretty amazing. You wrote a book, Paving a Woman's Path Through Menopause and Beyond. Wow. How and and why did you decide to write a book on menopause? Of course. So as a gynecologist, I was trained in menopause along with going through my training. I was trained in delivering babies. I was trained in doing hysterectomies. I was trained in prescribing hormone replacement therapy, doing breast exams, all of those different things. And so part of my training after four years of med school, then four years of OB-GYN residency, I was trained in how to work with people with menopause. And so that was part of my part of my clinical practice. Even when I became a professor, I still volunteered at a nonprofit clinic doing women's health focused lifestyle medicine. And so even though I had that training, menopause was never quite the, the super flashy thing, I guess, that I was naturally drawn to dive even like deeper and deeper into. It was part of my practice. But then three years ago, I got that phone call that no one wants to receive, where I found out that on a routine screening mammogram that I had a two centimeter breast cancer mass that was invading my chest wall. So I had no strong family history. I breastfed all of my kids. I, um, I had done all of the, the right things. I didn't drink alcohol in excess. I was exercising. I was as healthy as I thought I had ever been. So on a routine screening mammogram, I did had, it was perfectly normal, 3D, everything was perfect. A year later, that two centimeter mass, and I couldn't feel it. It was hiding behind my nipple and it was invading my chest wall. So even before they did the biopsy, I said, let me see if I can try to find this. I was trained. These fingers were trained in order to find breast cancer masks on other women where I did clinical breast exams. I could not feel this. It was all invading deep in my chest wall behind my nipple. So I had, it was a very aggressive breast cancer. I had a bilateral mastectomy followed by a removal of my ovaries. And then I've had four reconstructive surgeries. I'll have another one, hopefully my last next month. And I also had 16 rounds of chemotherapy. So immediately I was put into menopause with chemotherapy. My ovaries were removed and I can't be on any hormones because of the type of breast cancer that I have. And so I went from never having had a hot flash to the next day I was in full blown menopause. And even though I'd heard about the symptoms from my patients, the brain fog, the the mood kind of up and downs, the hot flashes, the night sweats, the problem sleeping, even though I had heard of it, it was a different thing to experience. It was a different thing to experience it. And a lot of it, I thought, well, this is due to chemotherapy. I think that these are symptoms I'm going through because of chemotherapy. And there were definitely chemotherapy symptoms. But when I finished chemotherapy, I was, um, unfortunately, I realized that many of the symptoms that continued to linger were truly menopause symptoms. So then I went on a quest. I already knew about lifestyle medicine and menopause, or I thought I knew a lot. And so I started using what I learned and it was helping me feel better. I started digging into the research and realizing there's a lot of research. And then I started to be asked about this by other, my fellow breast cancer survivors who often go through menopause early as well. And they said, what books are there? What resources are there? And I said, let me look. And so I started looking and I couldn't find very much. I felt like it was either outdated. There there was information out there on lifestyle things, but it was like the latest research was from 20 years ago, or it went down. um, It didn't follow the evidence base. So it was suggesting different things. Like it's great if people like crystals and rocks, but don't tell me that there is science behind using a crystal to help my hot flashes, unless I can see the research. Or I felt like that there were other ones that were saying it's only diet or lifestyle. And you're crazy for even considering using any 
medications. And so I wanted one that really gave a balanced viewpoint. And I'm part of the team that wrote the initial Paving the Path to Wellness workbook with Dr. Beth Frady. She's the one who founded the program. She started it out of Harvard Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital about 15 years ago. So Paving the Path to Wellness is a 12-step or 12-week healthy lifestyle program that she designed. All the things our grandmothers taught us, right? So nutrition, physical activity, stress reduction, sleep, social connections, but it also includes energy. How do we manage our energy and have get good, natural, healthy sources of energy? Purpose. How do we connect what we do to our purpose? Attitude. How does our attitude impact our health? Using variety and investigation and goal setting, all that science of behavior change. So Dr. Frady's program, when I finished treatment for chemotherapy, I did a survivorship program at my local hospital, and it was the most depressing group I've ever been a part of. I attended one meeting and vowed to never go back. It was so sad and so depressing. And so Dr. Beth Frady's, the pandemic had just started and the silver lining of it was that Dr. Amy Commander, another co-author of mine, her breast cancer paving the path to wellness group for breast cancer survivors had just moved from in-person at one of the Harvard hospitals to online. And Beth said, you should join her program. And I thought, I do not need a support group. I thought I have all of this figured out. I know about nutrition and exercise and stress and sleep. I know that. So I joined the group though, Beth suggested it. Beth is a mentor of mine and I respect her immensely, but I joined it and I realized how powerful that group setting was. And so I became a fan of Paving the Path to Wellness. We spent the next year or so, Dr. Beth Frady's, Dr. Amy Commander and myself writing the Paving the Path to Wellness workbook based off of Dr. Frady's work at Harvard. And so it was after that book was already going, all the proceeds of that book and my new book, they all go to the nonprofit organization, Paving the Path to Wellness. But Beth Frady's was the one who said, and I, when I talked to her about how I cannot find a book, do you know of any good books out there? She said, you need to write the book. And I said, nope, I'm done. I just edited a textbook and I did Paving the paving the work, what Path to Wellness workbook. I said, I am not doing another one. And she said, you know, that book needs to be written. And I said, I know it needs to be written. So she said, I will meet with you every week until we have this book out. And that's where this paving, paving a woman's path through menopause and beyond with myself, Dr. Beth Frady's and Dr. Amy Commander, my two dear friends and colleagues out of Harvard. That's where this book that's where this book came from. And there, and there are their pictures. So this all is based out of Dr. Frady's work. It's been a labor of love and every proceed, everything from this and our other workbook all go back to the nonprofit organization because it really is our goal to get this information to as many people as possible. So that was a long answer, but that's, yeah. So it was my personal going through menopause about a decade earlier than I had planned on doing it. Then realizing that the book that I really felt like patients deserved did not exist. And then the encouragement of two dear friends and colleagues and and today, today is actually the first official day that it's, that it's available. So November 4th. Oh, exciting. And is it available on Amazon? It sure is. It sure is. And through the oh, publisher Healthy Learning. Yeah, it is. That is awesome. And, and well done to you for doing that because I know we need it in, because nobody is talking about it. No. And I have to show you. So this is really exciting too. And it's in color. It has beautiful color. Look at these. Uh, I know I'm proud of the color. I love the color. I love all the resources. So it, anyway, it turned out to be a beautiful, a beautiful book that I'm super proud of. And I hope that, I hope it'll help a lot of women. Oh my gosh. How awesome is that? Thank you for doing that. I really, the three of you ladies, I mean, seriously. And because I know, like I've been through menopause, <laughs> been there, done that. And I was plant-based when I went through menopause and I remember vaguely just having a few hot flashes here or there, but nothing like, you know, like some people feel like, you know, they've been lit on fire, you know, yes. and I really yes. didn't have that. I just had a few, a little bit. So I really feel like, like being on a plant-based diet helped me tremendously. So talk to us about how nutrition and the impact on menopausal symptoms. Yes, it has a tremendous impact. And I'm sure that having a, having a healthy diet did help you with going through that menopause transition. Also, one of the things too about this book, even though it's from menopause, it's menopause and beyond, because I think there's so much that we, we often focus on women during that menopause transition, but it really is the woman in their like mid forties who might be approaching the average age of menopause is 51 in the United States and then beyond, because there's so much that we can do with healthy lifestyle behaviors. But yeah, so soy, so eating whole, whole soy, uh, soy that's organic, 
Um, so whether that's soy milk or whether that's edamame or whether that's some organic tofu, I encourage every woman who's in that kind of age range to enjoy one, two, three servings or so a day of soy from whole or minimally processed soy. I'm not a fan of soy isolates and supplements. I think we don't know enough about what that actually does to the estrogen receptor. We know that when we have it in that whole, whole or minimally processed soy form, that it, it actually is very protective of the estrogen receptors. It gives them a mild stimulation, but but doesn't overly stimulate them. So it really has that, that beautiful protective effect. And soy is, is safe even for breast cancer survivors who are ER or PR positive, like myself. We now know the research to know that it actually is beneficial too. Fiber, fiber is fabulous for females. FFF, fiber is fabulous for females. We are a fiber deprived group. So we should all be getting about 25 or so grams of fiber a day, um, maybe after menopause, maybe a little bit lower, but I actually like the American Institute of Cancer Research's um, recommendation to get about 30 grams or so a day. Now, if you're not doing it right now, I don't recommend going all from like a standard American diet all the way up here, which I know many of your, your um, listeners aren't already, but I encourage people to keep a fiber diary and see where they're at so they can gradually work their way up. But we need to be getting that fiber because fiber is important for a healthy microbiome, those trillions of bacteria that support our health that live in our gut. And the part of the microbiome that supports hormonal health in women, the estrobolum, it's responsible for metabolizing, helping to modulate estrogen. And so if we are not feeding our microbiome and keeping them nourished with enough fiber, we are starving our microbiome, but we are also starving our estrobolum. And with our estrobolum, we need it. It's kind of like that Goldilocks thing, not too much, not too little. We need it to be just right. And we have to be nourishing our microbiome and nourishing our estrobolum for our estrogen um, to be functioning properly. And that becomes even more important after we go through menopause because the microbiome becomes a little more touchy or it can be thrown out of balance easier after menopause. So it becomes even more important that we're protecting our microbiome by eating fi high fiber foods. I recommend getting probiotics, but I don't recommend probiotic supplements unless somebody's working with their physician and they're specifically targeting something. I recommend that people get their probiotics through eating foods, fermented foods. Like I always have some plant-based yogurt in my smoothie every day. For some people, it's, for some people, it's tempeh. You can get some different pickles. They're going to be in the refrigerated section of the refrigerated section of the grocery store, sauerkraut. So looking at those different options and getting in some fermented food every day, that's really beneficial for the, the microbiome. Limiting caffeine, looking at triggers. So for some people, spicy foods are a trigger for hot flashes. For some people, they're not. So then if you enjoy spicy foods, it's not triggering your hot flashes, that's fine. But if you are experiencing hot flashes, doing a journal or being mindful of what's causing them. For some people, it's spicy foods. For some people, it's caffeine. So working on limiting those. Getting enough omega-3 fatty acids is really important. So in my smoothie every day, I have some ground flax seeds. Make sure that they're ground. If you happen to buy the type that aren't ground, like I accidentally did recently, just make sure you grind those things up because that's how you get those good omega-3 fatty acids from them. Eating a variety of colorful, colorful plants. So making sure that you're getting your, getting your berries in, getting your green, your leafy greens, your spinach, your kale all of those. So those are, so a lot of things though, it's kind of interesting. Like I, I would love to be able to tell you that there was like a certain, a certain surprise food that was going to be fabulous for menopause, but really it's the same diet that supports brain health. It's the same diet that supports heart health. It's that same diet, a whole food plant predominant diet that has healthy and adequate protein. We know that there's some great research showing that getting women who are at the highest levels of healthy plant proteins that they live longer, healthier lives, that they have a decreased risk of dementia. So really prioritizing that plant protein. Um, those are kind of like the, the key pieces. I go into some different things in more depth in the book and happy to share more of that later, but just making sure that you're getting that, that those high quality plant foods is really important. Oh, and I just got to say, you know, I do the same thing. I make my own yogurt and it is ridiculously easy, ridiculously easy to make. I mean, seriously, if you have an instant pot, literally, I mean, it, it, I can't say enough about it because when you buy store-bought yogurts, you're going to get a lot of other chemicals in there, sugars added, natural flavors. We don't know what that is, you know, all that other stuff. I know exactly what's going into my yogurt. And I think that's what okay, I need to learn things. that gene. Yeah. I need no. to learn that from you. And it's expensive. The last time, oh my goodness, I was like, this is so expensive. So, okay, then Gene, I'm going to 
I'll become a, a, a plant yogurt maker. I need to learn that. Sim- ridiculously, ridiculously easy. I mean, seriously. So right. anyway, physical activity. It, why is this important for peri and postmenopausal women? Oh my goodness. It becomes even more important. So first of all, your gut microbiome, like it, when you exercise your core body temperature goes to a, gets a little bit warmer and it's actually an ideal temperature that helps to support the growth of good bacteria and not our bad bacteria, which I think is just absolutely fascinating. Also the places like the blue zones where people live the longest, the healthiest, they're typically moving about every 20 minutes or so. So it's not like they go to the gym and do the huge workout on the weekends or whatever, but no, they're just incorporating more movement into their lives. So there's two main parts of uh, the physical activity that I like to talk about for my peri and postmenopausal women. The first is getting adequate aerobic activity. The recommendation is 150 minutes a week. You can break it up into little tiny pieces, but I tell people it's okay. Like if you're not, if 150 minutes sounds so crazy that you're like, I don't even want to think about that. That's going to make me shut down. Then I want you to start wherever you are at. If it's just that getting up to stretch and do some nice stretches or sitting on a ball chair, like I am right now, just getting in a little bit, getting in a little bit of that movement, moving a little bit more. So trying to get a little bit of cardio, moving on, moving more and sitting less. And then also trying to break up, break up your day. I know I sit for meeting after meeting sometimes in front of the zoom, or I love to make lectures and find cool slides. And so I can spend hours, but I actually have a reminder that goes off on my watch every hour that reminds me to get up. And I've been looking at some of the, the research around exercise snacks. And so I try to do like, so I'm 45. I try to do 40, actually I'm 45 and a half. So I've been trying to do 45 and a half jumping jacks. When I stand up um, every hour, if I've been seeing, I'll stand up and I'll try to do jumping jacks. But even uh, there's some research on like running the stairs, running up the stairs and down the stairs, only if you're cleared by your doctor to do vigorous physical activity. But even if you're at the point where you're like, I just, I just want to do something, even just getting up and stretching, it can feel so good just to get up. Even if it's to walk around your family room once before you sit back down, just trying to incorporate some more movement. And then also resistance training is really easy, is really important, especially as we age. And, and that's something that I have to admit, I'm not a fan of, I'm not a fan of extra, I'm not a fan of resistance training. However, the research shows that when we go through menopause, that we lose typically lean muscle mass and we gain fat mass that decreases our metabolism, makes gaining even more weight, more likely. And so in order to fight that, in order to stay I, I want to be able to pick up, not that I like laundry, but I want to be able to pick up that laundry basket and still do laundry. I want to be able to play with my kids. And so I try to do some resistance. I have some resistance bands that are in my bedroom after I do Zumba in front of my bed for a few minutes every morning. Then I try to do some of those different resistance bands, but just doing some resistance training where you really try to maintain your muscle mass. We're not going to make you a bodybuilder. That takes a lot of specialized training, um, but just doing some resistance training and then also balance, balance a fall with a fracture is the number one cause of women losing their independence of going into like a rehabilitation nursing home and sometimes passing away after, after a series of, of events. And so it's important that we maintain our balance. When I went through chemotherapy, I got some neuropathy. And so balance, my balance is not what it used to be. So I have one of those like half balls and I work with a physical therapist to help me with some different balance exercises that I could safely do. Cause the last thing you want to do is injure yourself while you're trying to work on your balance. So consider asking your doctor for a referral to a physical therapist or helping you to put together a program that's right for you. Cause you have to be doing something that's fun, something that brings you joy. I don't like to sweat. I don't like to do the typical exercise thing, but I have fun doing my Zumba in front of my bed to this fun group in Brazil that is, or no, in Belgium, a group in Belgium that I like to follow. So finding something that works for you and then just trying to move a little bit more is, is really important. It's extra important though, as we go through menopause and beyond. Me and Bruce, we like to dance in the dark together. Yay. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) Me and Bruce. Yeah. There's that one video of Bruce where he pulls up this girl out of the, out of the audience and starts dancing with her on the stage. And I'm like, yeah, I'm that girl. (laughs) That's wonderful. <laughs> and and you're right. I sit on a ball. Thanks. I'm the same way. I mean, mm-hmm. because yeah, yeah. you know, it yeah. just it makes <laughs> such a huge difference because I know like if I sit for long periods of time, I get up, I feel like I'm 400 years old. Yes. But sitting yes, on the yes. ball, it changes your core structure. Mm-hmm. You it have does. to really have good tight, you know, tight core in here to really and you have to sit up straight because yeah. you have nothing yeah. supporting your back. 
So you mm-hmm. have to sit up straight. So yeah. there's a lot of dynamics. And then I just roll the ball out. Like when I have a break of like 10 minutes or something like that, I'll do some push-ups. I put my feet up on the end of the ball or I'll, I'll roll backwards, you know, cause I can't do a back bend anymore. I used to, at one point, I used to be able to do back bends and gymnastics and all that. Kind of, yeah, no, I'm like, yeah. So like I'll roll backwards on the ball and it just feels so good to just change that and have a little bit of inversion, you know, on my head. So yeah, I love sitting on, I will never, ever go back to a chair and sitting on yeah, a chair. This is what I have is actually a ball chair. So it's, I don't lean back on it, but it actually is this. So right. it has like little, little rollers, but you can take the ball off and it's, um, but it's a great way just to get in a little bit of extra. No, I'm just sitting on the ball. I have a 65 centimeter ball that okay. I just sit on and That's it nice. is the best because you know, a lot of people tend to sit back against that backrest, number one. And that way, uh uh-uh, no, I have (laughs) nothing to lay against. I mean, I have nothing. So I have to sit up straight. I have Mm -hmm. to. So it really forces me to do that. So Mm -hmm. I've seen those chairs, you know, and I've tried them, but you know what? I like really just sitting right on the ball straight on because I can do so much more with that Mm -hmm. and move a lot more because it's not containing me in the chair. Yeah. Okay. Sleep. Wow. This is another one, especially as we get older and you have to get up, they make that trip into the bathroom every, you know, at least once or twice a night, you know, Ah. what are some lifestyle suggestions for women going through menopause and beyond? Sure, sure, sure. So great question. So sleep often gets harder for women when they go through menopause and then beyond. We know that deep sleep decreases as we age. There's a few things, actually, there's a lot of different things that we can do. We know hot flashes or night sweats, um, hot flashes that happen at night, night sweats often wake people out of their deep sleep. So doing healthy lifestyle behaviors, such as eating a whole food plant predominant diet, such as not eating things that have a lot of sugar where you're going through the sugar cycle or where you're having a blood sugar up and down crash, that's beneficial. Doing physical activity, but usually in the mornings or the very early afternoons is beneficial for sleep that, um, that night. Getting, if you can, bright outside light in the morning is ideal because that helps with all of our melatonin timing. So getting outside some bright morning light. And then as you get closer in the evening, turning down your lights. I try to dim like two or three hours before bedtime. I try to dim the lights, turn the lights down. We're not completely in the dark, but I just try to like turn off some of the lights and get it a little bit, a little bit darker, a little bit cozy or trying to limit screens before bedtime. Oh my goodness. We know so many people are actually using their screens in bed and I'm sometimes at fault for that, but I'm getting much better. The more literature I read, the more I read, the more I'm like, it's on silent. It's over there. If somebody texts or whatever, it's okay. So I putting that away, trying to limit screens, or if we do use screens, like on my phone, I think it's at seven o'clock at night, it goes to a different, like um, a a night type of setting where it's more like yellowish. You can actually look for those blue light filters, really trying to wind down, get your body in a, a regular routine. Also getting our body really used to a routine. So I, you know, wake up around the same time every day and go to bed around the same time every day. So I go to bed usually around nine o'clock or so every night. I'm pretty serious about that now being a cancer survivor, because there's some literature out there, even on the importance of sleep and cancer, as well as a lot of other health things. Whereas remember I was an OB guy. So I used to do deliveries throughout the middle of the night, the worst sleep ever, but trying to have a really regular routine as much as possible is beneficial. Also, we found that a drop in core body temperature, so having a warmer body temperature, a drop in core body temperature helps with melatonin release, and it can help us increase deep sleep. So taking a, um, like a warm shower or a warm bath, or if you have a hot tub, going into a hot tub at night, that increase warm temperature and then that decrease help you to increase your deep sleep. Even sometimes just splashing water on your face can help as well with that temperature change. And then keeping your hands and your feet warm. So like I actually have a bed heater where I can just turn on the feet or you can put, throw on your, your warm, cozy socks as well, but keeping your feet warm helps you to helps to have that core body temperature change that allows for more deep sleep. There's some research out there around tart cherry juice, maybe in the evening that that can be beneficial as well. Not eating a really large meal late at night. I'm trying to drink more of your liquids towards the beginning and middle of the day so that as you get into the night, you're, you're limiting your fluid intake a little bit. And of course, not drinking caffeine as you get towards the end of the day. 
remembering to go to the bathroom one last time right before falling asleep because many women do wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you want to make sure you have adequate light because once again, I, the when I was very first a, a guest faculty for Harvard Institute of Life Summits, and it was on bone health and I saw the statistics on how many people get fall and have fractures. So you want adequate light to go to the bathroom, but you also don't necessarily need to turn on every bright light in your bedroom. So if you can have night lights or certain things where they are, are turned on to keep it adequately lit, but it doesn't need to, you don't need to turn on like every single light, but make sure that it's safely lit, have your glasses by your bedside or whatever it is, it is that you need to grab and then safely go to the bathroom and then come back to bed to get in a routine. What works best for you? What's in your toolbox? Is it reading a relaxing book? Is it doing some gratitude journaling? Is it is it praying or is it meditating or is it doing some deep breathing? Like what is it for you that helps you to relax or some different stretching or yoga poses are really beneficial for people. So looking at what can you do during the day? And so a lot of that is, is managing your stress, prioritizing physical activity and healthy eating throughout the day, that light exposure. What can you do as you come down toward the end of the day, preparing to get your body and mind ready. And then and then when you go to sleep and then also there's a lot of great information on cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia insomnia cbti a lot of people say well i i don't sleep as well now and i think that i think that i i've heard that it gets worse and that they're just going to give me a sleeping pill so i'm not always anti-sleeping pills however i do not believe that they are first line treatment nor should they be for most people most people it's called sleep hygiene there's a lot that we can do based upon our behavior and then also cognitive behavioral therapy, changing how we think about sleep and about learning some different techniques has been shown to be really powerful in the perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopausal women. So, and also being on the lookout for sleep apnea, our symptoms aren't always the same as women as they are in men. So, so talk with your doctor, with your primary care provider, talk to them about sleep problems. Don't assume that everything, the only thing they have to offer is a sleeping pill but talk about sleep hygiene. Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep. I love that book. That's a great resource too. So check those out. Oh, I, always <laughs> really, I heard from Dr. Neil Barnard. We talked about this several times. I'm going to throw this out there, but yawning before you start to get into bed, even if you're not yawning, you don't feel like a yawn, all of a sudden, Oh, do that four or five times by the fifth time. That's a real yawn. You're right. You know? And then that's starting to trigger a lot of, of release. Also some uh, essential oils, you know, mm-hmm. using some essential oils, especially like lavender. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. I smell yes. that. And I'm just like, I'll, I just start melting, you know, yes. I just yes. really just power right down very quickly, especially yes. if you have trouble getting back to sleep, like you get up in the bathroom and then like my head just turns on and it's like, I can't power it down. Mm-hmm. And so what I do is I, I put, you know, a little bit of lavender, like on my, mm-hmm. not on my pillow, but like on a tissue or something like that. And then just like get, kind of put it near me. And it's like, yeah, I, I smell that. And I'm like, bye. You're training your brain that that's what, yeah, that that's one of the things you associate with sleep. So it's a beautiful example. It is. So, okay. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> you know, as we go through menopause, yeah, we tend to notice weight gain um, and, or like, like like my fat and I, okay. Like I've lost hundred pounds, but my, you know, and I still have some more to go, but my fat and I, we've been together for a long time and it does not want to give up the mothership. I mean, and, and anytime I hear these men that were like, Oh yeah, I went plant-based and overnight I lost 400 pounds and you know, I'm like, I want to hurt them. I do, <laughs> you know, cause like I've been trying for a long time, you know, <laughs> what can we do? Mm-hmm. So know that first of all, know that you and everyone else going through this, that you're not alone. It does become more difficult after menopause with the hormonal changes. We often see that increase. So even if somebody keeps eating the same things and moving the same amount with that change in hormone levels, we see an increase in fat mass and a decrease in lean muscle mass, especially if we're not doing any resistance training. And so that slows our metabolism down and often leads to about a 10 pound or so average weight gain. And so that's where like when we go through menopause, even if we haven't been doing resistance training before, we need to start doing some resistance training. We need to be physically active. We need to be really eating and nourishing our microbiomes, lots of healthy plant-based foods. Um, Those are some different things that help. Also, we know that sleep, sleep plays a huge role in fat. We know that when we are sleep deprived, Mm -hmm. so these are three, so when we go through menopause, 
when we are sleep deprived or when we are super stressed, there are three different things that, can, that happen with each of these. But then when you put them all together, you can really get a triple whammy. So we know that with sleep deprivation, increased stress, or just going through menopause, the amount of ghrelin that we release, which is the hunger hormone increases. I think of it like the gremlin, like eat this, eat this, eat this, eat this. Like, yeah, like I know it's not nourishing, eat that candy anyway. So a gremlin, so the increases ghrelin, it decreases leptin and leptin is the hormone that makes us feel full, that makes us feel satiated. So that goes down. So even after we eat a big meal and we're like, I know this is nourishing, I ate this whole meal, but then your, your mind is telling you, I'm still hungry. I'm still hungry because you don't have as much leptin. So ghrelin increases, leptin decreases. That happens when you go through menopause because of the hormonal changes. Now, if you are sleep deprived, that's even worse. Now, if you are sleep deprived, you're stressed and you've gone through menopause, even more so. So you're dealing with that ghrelin leptin imbalance. And so in order to, in order to deal with that, what we need to do is realize that we're more susceptible to that. When we go through menopause, that's part of the journey. I wish I could say otherwise, but I can't, but it means we need to be even more diligent about protecting our sleep, getting at least seven hours of sleep a night, um, high quality high quantity. It doesn't mean you're not starting going to wake up in the middle of the night. I have that new problem too. Now that I've gone through menopause, but really trying to prioritize like about realizing its importance. We know that people who are really stressed or who are sleep deprived when they, um, so when people are sleep deprived or really stressed, they eat on average 300 to 500 more calories a day. And when they are doing that, they're not going after the broccoli, right? They're going after those foods with a lot of added sugar, added salt and fat. Also, we know that when people are highly stressed or sleep deprived, that it's more difficult to lose weight and the weight that they do, people do lose, it's more likely to be muscle mass. It's not fair. So if you're losing weight and you are sleep deprived, you're more likely to be losing muscle mass when we want to lose fat mass and maintain our muscle mass. So that's why like the more that I learned, the more I realized that nutrition, physical activity, stress, and sleep are so intimately intertwined. They just, you can't really pull one apart. You really have to look at all of those and, and that, that whole, that whole health. So those are recommendations that I have as far as sleep, but also once again, it's, it's much more than calories in calories out. You are not alone struggling. There are doctors with expertise out there. So please do not suffer in silence or struggle alone or be embarrassed, reach out and talk to your healthcare provider. And if they are not in a listening ear, who is, who's wanting to help then find someone else you might want to talk to a dietitian. There's lots of dietitians who are a whole food plant player dominant. You might want to talk to them. You might want to talk to a physical therapist or get a referral to a physical therapist or somebody who can help you with moving more in a way. Like I told my um, physical therapist, I do not want to sweat one extra drop of sweat. Like I want every drop to count. I want to exercise as little as possible and get the maximum effect for it. So you can, you can work with these people. And there's also people who are obesity medicine specialists or doctors who can really help you look at some of the, some of the different things weight is so complex and it does become harder for most women after menopause, but no, you're not alone. Reach out, you know, do all the healthy lifestyle things. And then still though, you know, reach out and talk to these experts because there are, there are different, different things out there. So there's, there's help reach out. Well, and I just want to throw out a, a shout out to Dr. Deborah Shapiro, who is an OBGYN. She's whole food plant based and she does. She's a lifestyle coach and helps people to get through menopause through these issues. And I think yes. you're right. You know, you have to be able to connect with other women, other women who've gone through this and nothing disparaging against men. But honestly, until you've had a, you know, a full blown, like, like, wow, like hot flash, you're not going to mm -hmm. understand it. You know, yes, or think, the mood I, roller coaster. Like I told my husband, like yeah. it used to be that what would have made me just be like a little stressed. Now sometimes it's like <gasps> that's. Really so I think connecting yeah. with other women, I do I think too. Is a huge thing because we're dealing with the same sure. issues and the same plumbing, you know, yeah. and and the the problems. And men, while they've studied it, they've studied it. It's not in you know inside them, and they're not going through it. So once you go through it, it's like, wow, yeah, okay, I get it now. I get it. So what advice do you have for peri and postmenopausal women? Yeah. So reach out, know that you're not alone. You're not going crazy. You know, we see women all the time who say like, I think maybe I have early dementia. Not that that doesn't happen. Talk with your healthcare provider. But like, there's just so many different symptoms that come along with the perimenopausal and menopausal transition. Many of them are the same. 
However, a, women experience different things to different intensities and know that you are not alone. It's just that our society does not honor aging as I wish that they did, uh, but I'm on a mission to help change that. But I, but know that we're in a society that, that elevates youth and that it's up to all of us to change the dialogue and to show how powerful and amazing women are who are perimenopausal, who are postmenopausal, that we are not defined by when our ovaries say that they have, that they don't need to keep producing an egg every month, that to kind of like, just to see that wisdom and that beauty and that power in, in aging and in healthful living. The more I learn about blue zones too, the more I realize that it's, it's not the, the number, it's not how many birthdays you have, but it really is it's the life, it's the vitality, it's what you do, it's connecting with your purpose and your attitude and adding variety investigations into your life and trying different foods and ways of cooking. Like I need to make the plant yogurt now. So I'm going to investigate that and learn. So it's about trying all these new things and looking at your overall health and well being. So I'd encourage anybody who wants to check out the Paving the Path to Wellness nonprofit organization's website, Dr. Frady's, Dr. Commander and I, really it is our goal just to share that message with the world. So feel free to check that out. Look for other resources, look for other people in your community. People need connection. A lot of people are lonely, even especially now after the pandemic. So if you're lonely, once again, you are not alone. It's as women, I think that we feel like we should never be lonely, that we should all have tons of friends, but loneliness is, um, there's a loneliness pandemic too, if you want to read that, that chapter in the book and loneliness can hurt our emotional well-being, mental health, and also our physical well-being. So it is important that we're connected with one another, that we have some meaningful connections. It doesn't mean that you need 5,000 friends. It doesn't mean you have to be doing something every day. It doesn't mean you have to be super busy on social media, but you do need some strong connections to really support you. And so Paving the Path to Wellness is trying to help that. There are a lot of other great nonprofit organizations, faith families, faith communities that are doing that too. So community organizations, but just reach out, be connected, don't suffer in silence, don't worry in silence, get your mammogram or do your talk with your doctor about your, your breast health and yeah, just take care of yourself. You deserve it. I, I have to agree. And I just got to share a quick story. When uh, I was in perimenopause, I started getting migraines. Mm-hmm. And so my, my regular doctor said, you know, that's not normal because most people start migraines, you know, when they're younger and to start them at your age, I'm kind of, it's concerning. So to make a long story short, I go to, you know, a specialist, you know, a brain specialist and he ran me through the gauntlet. I mean, for like six, seven months, even from sleep testing to you name it. And every test came back, you know, I was fine. I was fine. I was fine. I was fine. And he's like, you know, oh my God. I mean, I I was so scared. I kid you not, Michelle. I was so scared. I literally, because it was a single mom at the time and I was looking at what what happened to me because he had me literally like selecting my coffin, you know, and I was so scared that I was going to die because he's like, oh my God, this can only be one thing, like a brain tumor that you have, you know, we need to do some, some further testing. And I'm like, what? You know, I mean, like, I was so scared. I mean, literally I was going to see a lawyer about what would happen if I died in, you know, for my children, because my children were at that time are like teenagers, young teenagers. I mean, that's how scared I was. And I went to my OBGYN and, you know, for my annual check under the hood, you know, uh, meet, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. and office visit. And she she says, has anything changed? I said, yeah, I started getting, you know, migraines. And she's like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's not a problem. Once you get through menopause, most likely they'll stop. And I'm like, She's like, you're in perimenopause. You're shifting all these hormones and you're going to have some. And I'm like, oh my God, you need to go talk to the neurologist. He had me dead. You know, and, and I think that's one of the things that we tend to do is, is we compartmentalize our, our certain parts of our body when in reality, yeah. it's one. It's one body, one system. Yeah. And is, you've got to sure. understand that. And I think you need to get to somebody who's got a little bit more understanding about what's going on in that, you know, if it wasn't for my OBGYN, she, you know, I would have still, I would have been hysterical. I mean, like literally I was so stressed for like literally six, eight months. I really thought, you know, there was something really, really wrong with me. And there wasn't, it was just perimenopause. Yeah. yeah. Most OB guys oh. should be able to help manage that, but there's also what's called NAMS, the North American menopause society, N A M S which are ob and other physicians who have additional training or that's an area they're really passionate about. So if you have any listeners who are looking for somebody who really likes to focus on menopause, 
they may want to check out the website, the North American Menopause Society, and they have some great resources too. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and and doing that book for all women out there. I just got to say, thank you so much for that because we need to have a good manual. (laughs) Like we didn't come with, we didn't come out of the shoot with this manual, (laughs) like all these changes you're going to go through. So thank mm-hmm. you for doing that. And thank you for taking the time to, to be with us here today. Thank you for letting me connect with you and with your listeners. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.